Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to another episode of Rethink Culture, the podcast that shines a spotlight on business leaders who are rethinking workplace culture. My name is Andreas Constantino and I'm your host and I'm also chairman and founder at Slash Data. I see myself as an accidental micromanager who turned servant leader over the years and developed a personal pa- passion for workplace culture. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share on the podcast, please let me know by emailing rethink at rethinkculture.co. Now, today I have the very rare pleasure of having with me Vern Harnish. Vern is the founder of the Entrepreneurs' Organization and uh, Scaling Up, which is a global coaching and education company. Vern, very welcome to the Rethink Culture podcast. Great. It's good to join you. And as you know, it's a hugely important topic, culture. It is. Before we get to that, I should say that uh, the organization you founded, EO, has been a huge influence in my life. And people understand the influence when I say that my life is before and after EO. And okay, I divorced right at the point where I joined EO, so that has something to do with it. But uh, yes. um, it's before and after EO, and I'm very thank- thankful for that. Moving to culture. What is culture for you, Vern? It is. It came from the word cult, interestingly enough. Mm. And that's the thing Jim Collins found is that a really strong culture is cult-like. And so it is a group of people that have a certain set of norms and behaviors and rules that they've agreed to operate under that's common, that makes them unique from other groups of people. And that's really the culture. You talk at some point about how culture can be as unique and in some cases as weird or different as you can imagine. Like there's... Um, I, th- I think at some point you talk about case studies of a company which um, pays people based on the number of hours they work uh, or, you know, any other example of culture. Um, yeah. Do you, do you want to build on that? Well, yeah. Well, you know, Michael Porter at Harvard, you know, the great father of strategy said, you really don't have a strategy if what you do isn't different. So if you price the same way everyone else does, you're not different. If you compensate the same way everyone else does, you're not different. And if you hire the same kind of people that everybody else hires, then you're really not different. And so one of my favorite books is Daniel Cable's Out of London Business School's book called Change to Strange and how a strange workforce can really power forward the culture and the company. And so you start with, all right, what's your weirdness? You know, what's strange about you? And so what you're referring to is Lincoln Electric. Uh, Right now, pay in the 100 best places to work. When they surveyed the CEOs, what are your priorities for 2023? Again, these are the best places to work, not, you know, average size companies. Pay, you know, traditionally has always been fourth on the list ahead of culture and caring and some of the other things that are important. Pay rocketed to number one for 2023 as their focus because of the inflationary pressures and everything else. And so I opened the book, uh, Scaling Up Compensation, with the Lincoln Electric example. And it's a company that builds welding equipment uh, out of the northeast part of the United States. Been around for 100 plus years. And among other things, you are guaranteed lifetime employment. They have never had a layoff in the history of the 100 plus years of the, the company. But their compensation would be considered draconian in any other culture. You eat what you produce. You you get paid what you produce. It's very piecemeal. So if you have a sick day, there's no sick days off. You don't get paid. If you want to take vacation, it's not paid. If you want to work two shifts, you can make twice as much. And by the way, this would not be for most people on the planet. But they're not looking for 8 billion employees. They're looking for a few hundred. And that's what makes, I think, a great culture is it has such uniqueness or weirdness or strangeness that it attracts just enough people who who identify with that, that you can really power forward a very successful business with Lincoln Electric has. And so I think that's a good example of where you've got real alignment between all of your people systems including compensation and the culture. Do you find that this culture is often conscious or unconscious? Because 
I find, and at least from my own experience, um, it took me a long time until I consciously um, said, you know, this is how much we're paying and this is the reason we're paying this much. Or that our culture is more collective rather than individual. And I, I think I'm the rule rather than the exception in, in that CEOs are not so much aware of the culture they have built and the quirkness or strangeness that that includes. What's your view? You know, I've often referred to culture much like your child's personality. And by the way, part of that personality shows in the womb. So sort of that, part of that personality or culture is present in the startup, the very beginning days. It, it's a combination of the few people that you pull together in order to get the organization launched. But there is a nurture period over about five years up until age five where the personality is forming. And then the research is clear. Once it's in place by about the fifth year, it's not going to change much for the next 50 years. And so we find the same thing that a lot of it is accidental or situational, environmental, if you would, in those first five years of a company. But then by at that point, it's there. Whether you consciously or unconsciously tried to guide it to that point. And that's why it's important to do a discovery or a rediscovery exercise. And Jim Collins was right. Culture is not a nice to have. It's not a wish. It is what ended up becoming the personality of that organism, that organization. And so it's a discovery exercise to be able to bring it to the conscious so that you can work with its strengths and not try to change it. I mean, you try to change the fundamental personality of a child, you're going to send them into a lot of therapy for the next decades. The same with the culture. And it can be upsetting. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll share a story. So it must have been three decades ago, I was working with a company um, out of the southern part of Virginia. And this founder was this hard charging type A, take the hill, you know, no excuses kind of person. Yet his son had taken over the company and they were getting ready to be threatened by one of the biggest players in their industry. And the founder was frustrated that his son wasn't stepping up and wasn't getting tough and wasn't getting aggressive and wasn't getting competitive. So we did a discovery exercise of the culture. And what was interesting, Andreas, is the culture was in essence this family friendly culture that couldn't have been more opposite than the founder. You know, I usually ask people, do you have any children? And if they do, I say, do you have a child? You have no idea where they came from. And I do, <laughs> right? It's like they're so opposite of everyone else in the family. And that's what can happen. A founder, an entrepreneur can birth an organism, an organization that's the opposite of who they are. So I'll finish up that story. So we realized its culture was the opposite of the founder and was more like the son who was now CEO. We then brought in some experts. It was in the convenience uh, store space, some experts to say, all right, let's structure a marketing campaign to counter this player that's moving into the marketplace. The first thing they said, and they were very wise is, we know that if your ad campaign doesn't align with the culture, then it's gonna be a disaster. You're saying one thing, but doing something else. And that incoherence, the customer in the market can feel. So long story short, they built a campaign around being family and friendly, and they crushed this competitor. And the father, the founder had to realize that to thine own self be true, that the culture of the company is not the same as him. Just like your personality may not be the same as any one of your individual children. And so to me, that's the, the perfect right. analogy and why that alignment and discovery process is so important. So as the company grows, the culture is influenced from the bottom up, whereas in the early stages, it's mostly top down, influenced by the founder. Is that what you find? That may be an oversimplification, but I think uh, that's generally true. I, I think it's more from the outside in and the inside out. 
Mm. I think part of the environment you're operating in, some of the early experiences of the organization can begin to form it and some of the other people that you bring in over those first 60 months can add edges or take edges off of that culture. Uh, but I think within five years, uh, the culture is the culture and trying to mess, mess with it. So I'll tell you another story. So Sapien, uh, Jerry, um, um, the two founders uh, who, who launched Sapien had a set of five core values. And it was a very, very well-performing company. And then they did an acquisition. And this acquisition, they said, you know what? And they called it a merger. And there are no such thing as a merger. There's only an acquisition and only one culture can survive. But what they tried to do is blend the two. So they got rid of one of their five core values and they adopted one from the other company. And the company almost failed. Wow. And Stuart Moore, who used to teach at that MIT program that I founded, said, in hindsight, we concluded that's what killed us, is that we strayed from our five original core values. We tried to add one. They went back to the original five and the company took off again. Uh, when we were just with Scott uh, Farquhar with Atlassian, you know, Scott joined. It was in our workshop when they had about 50 employees. Today, they have 10,000. Back then they were starting up. Today they've got something north of 50 billion in market cap. And when I saw Scott a few months ago, he reiterated again, that discovery exercise we did back in 2005, a lot has changed from 50 employees to 10,000. But what hasn't are those five core values. They're at the heart. But he did say something interesting. He said, values are not your culture. And I'm like, Wow, that's the first I've heard that. And he said, the cultures could actually be somewhat different depending on the countries that we operate in. So there can be some cultural. So this word culture has some issues. It's like the word value. So he said, our core values, our five rules haven't changed since 2005. And by the way, I think if, if your listeners want to go to what I think is the best articulated set of core values. It is Atlassian. Just Google Atlassian core values. You're going to see a perfect video that I think every company should create. You're going to see that they're phrases, not words. You're going to see their phrases that you would expect them to, language they would use in Australia and in their company. They have a nice description and each one is anchored by a visual. I think there needs to be a visual symbol for each one of them. Those five haven't changed, but he said there are cultural nuances that are different in their Dutch headquarters versus their US headquarters versus their offices they've got in Australia. And I thought that was an important nuance. Beyond Atlassian, and there's, there's relatively few companies that we talk about, at least in the tech space that I am, that are role models for culture like Southwest Airlines is one, and maybe Netflix is another. Uh, but this very uh, Zappos could be another one. Like in your travels and your um, discussions, have you found any other companies that have built exemplary cultures that are worth talking about? Well, you know, I would first of all, uh, my buddy Kevin Oaks run a, wrote a really great book called Cultural Renovation. And I think, again, that represents that uh, the core values at Microsoft haven't changed, but Satya Nadala changed the culture from a, as he said, a know-it-all culture to a learn-it-all culture, from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. And so I think you can continue to learn and evolve without changing the fundamental rules of the game. And, and I equate core values like the rules of a professional sport. And I don't care what country you're in, we all share the same rules around tennis or football or any sport. That's what makes it a sport. But our approach to the game, the culture of that team can be radically different. And so I think that's where the distinction 
needs to be held. And you get a new coach. Look, we got Deion Sanders here, Mr. Primetime in Boulder, Colorado, where I'm, I'm broadcasting from. The CU Buffs went from winning only one game last year to now rank 18th in the nation. But he changed the culture radically and the players as, as part of the process. But he couldn't change the rules uh, of football. But let's get back to this question of people first. Let's maybe go down this. Yeah, that was my next question. What kind of companies have you come across that put people first? Or how do you help your clients create people first cultures? Yeah. And and there, I think we've got to go back and look at some research that was done done by uh, John Cotter at Harvard. Back in the late 80s, he published a book in, in the early 90s called uh, uh, Systems and uh, Culture and Performance. I'm going blank on the, on the name. I'll have to look it up. And what he did, he looked at 211 companies over an 11-year period, 207 companies over an 11-year period. And he said, I want to answer this question. Is it companies who put employees first? Do they perform better than companies who put customers first? or put stake or shareholders first. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a fundamental question that needed to be answered. And the answer surprised him and everybody. Oh, it was Corporate Culture and Performance was the name of the, the book. And what he found is it was none of those three. Somebody who said employees are number one or customers are number one or shareholders are number one. The companies that outperformed by a factor of 10 were those that treated all three equally. Mm. That the employees, customers, and shareholders were all like a three-legged stool. If any one of those legs is weak, the whole thing that falls sense. over. And that's, and that's, by the way, what led to the balanced scorecard. Now, if you speed forward three decades later, uh, the business roundtable decided just before the pandemic that maybe we should update what we think is the function of a business. And before it was to take care of the shareholder. They then said, you know what? It's the employees, the customers, the shareholders, and that fourth leg, the community. Mm -hmm. And it's companies that balance those equally, put all the people first. Not just, I think when people say people first, they're thinking employees. But I think we've got to put all people first, including those in the community and the company that balances that. The other thing I would comment on, we just hosted Hubert Jolie at our CEO summit at Harvard uh, a couple of weeks ago. And Hubert, by the way, wrote a book that I considered the number one business book when it came out two years ago called The Heart of Business. It's about his turnaround of Best Buy. You know, he took that share from $11 to 110, quarter million employees, um, and he had to make a lot of change there. And he said something interesting. You know, employee engagement, as measured by Gallup, hasn't moved a percent for 50 years. It dropped five points, actually, in the pandemic, but it's been about 19 percent for 50 years. And I had made this comment that I think that means the 6,000 leadership books written every year aren't worth the paper they're printed on. And Hubert got up then and he said, you know what, Vern, I agree. He said, I think we need to get rid of the word leadership and replace it with the word careship. That at the end of the day, what it means uh, to put people first is to care for them. That's the four letter word. And if your people and your customers and your community think you care for them, then they're gonna care for you, your company, and your people. And so I think it really comes down to care and being caring. So he suggested, let's call it careship instead of leadership. And I agree. Um, I, I, I agree, definitely. The, the word leader could be interpreted in so many different ways. It could be the, yeah. you know, the huge statue that everyone needs to look up to, which is the autocratic, leader or could be the servant leader, which is, you know, the tiny statue in that paradigm that like helps yeah. everyone become bigger. Um, the, the person that needs to be surrounded by people that are smarter than them and, and helps them grow. Yeah. 
um, yeah, we need the we, we need a clearer paradigm for sure. Yeah. Now, well, um, and, I, and I think what's happening, Andreas, is really nobody needs lead. I mean, we all we and, and what Jim Clifton's research found after surveying 100 million employees for the last 50 years is that nobody wants managed, and I think that really means nobody wants lead either. They do want coached. So I want a coach. I don't know a professional sports player who wants to be led, you know, but they want to be coached because they're all leaders when they're on the field. And I think for you to have a successful company, everyone needs to be a leader. And what I love about the Internet and AI is it's put the same power in our hands as only a few used to have. Only a few people had access to the information you have today. Only a few of people had the power that AI can provide. Now it's available to all of us. And so it's the democratization of the world. And that's what we're seeing inside organizations. That And, and I loved when uh, Scott Atlass at Atlassian said it, hey, I'm telling our managers to get back programming because Nobody, you know, get back playing on the field instead of standing around and telling people what to do. So I think, and this is what we're seeing is happening in the world. The traditional leaders, particularly of our countries, are trying to hold on to their power when that power is being dissipated. And we know this, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's why the leaders that are in power, the first thing they want to do is shut down or control social media. They don't want us all talking because if we do, we're going to figure out that we're smarter than they are. And that's what they don't want. Information was power. Now we're distributing it. Something else I wanted to ask you is your, your books, um, Scaling Up, Rockefeller Habits. There is a ton of very thoughtful material there about mm. processes and structure and just how to run a, a well-oiled business. If you were to write another book on culture and say, how do you build a strong culture? What would be the two or three important chapters in there? Mm. Well, I think first is being clear what the rules are what the norms are, the behaviors that are acceptable in this culture. And I think of Town Park. Uh, Jerry South, I met him when he had 200 employees. And by the way, it's not Google or Facebook. They park cars, you know, for major <laughs> hotel and restaurant chains. But yeah. at the end of the day, they park cars. But what he did is he took their six rules um, and by the way, you don't have to call them core principles either. Make up your own language. That's part of what makes a culture cool. I can't remember. They had a different name for them. But out of those six rules, they created what they called the 31 daily basics. And they picked 31 because that was the days of the month. And under each daily basic, they delineated three or four very specific behaviors, norms. And then every employee, and they scaled about 15,000 people parking cars, and they're a 24-7, 365 business. Anyone who was working a shift was in a daily huddle. And then that daily huddle, they would review one daily basic every day and audit whether they were really practicing those norms or behaviors. If you take three or four times 31, I think there really is a hundred little norms that make up a culture. And so I think first, right. one chapter would be very, being very clear, how do you convert those handful of rules, values, into a set of behaviors and norms that we all agree we're willing to play by? And by the way, if you look at the rule book of a professional sports team, it's this thick. I mean, it, and you, if you're a player, had better know every one of those subtle rules, or you could end up losing a game, which we saw happen just this weekend with a few of those. So that would be chapter one. I think chapter two would be the importance of professionalizing 
business and to really act less like a family. Everybody talks about, hey, we need to be more like a family. But I don't know about you, but the term dysfunctional family is an oxymoron, is a redundancy, right? I mean, by definition, families are dysfunctional. Uh, <laughs> and so, and families, and families don't scale. So we think it's important to replace this mindset of family with that of a professional sports team. You know, they've been the best performing asset class this century. So everything that you see in a professional sports team from the training and development to the coaching, to the conditioning, to the KPIs, everybody knows the score instantly, everybody knows their stats, to big scoreboards and trophies. Everything we've learned about running a high performance sports team, we could translate into a high performing culture. So I'd, th I'd say that'd be number two. And the third chapter would be this importance of creating a learning culture. Because I think if there's one thing I've seen common that separates the better performing cultures over those that aren't, is they understand you're either earning or learning. You're either winning or learning. And you get rid of the term losing. And it, so it's that growth mindset that Carol Dweck and now Mary Murphy, who's got a new book coming out in 2024, we just had her teach at, Mer at Harvard, uh, I think is sharing with companies around the globe. So those would be my three chapters. I was Norms. Yeah. Norms, be professional and create a culture of learning. I was reading um, Jeff Sutherland's book on Scrum. Who's, he's the founder of Scrum. Yeah. And yeah. he, as he was describing what Scrum is and how it came about, to me, <clears throat> the major difference with Waterfall is that of continual learning and of mm. doing the 20% that drives 80% of the result. But really, it's about continual learning, like every two weeks, every month, every whatever sprint interval. Yeah. You, ref you, you sit back, you reflect, and you improve. And that is what drives the 3x, 4x typical performance advantage over waterfall methods. And, and I would take it further. I, you know, we often use um, the analogy from fighter pilots, the OODA loop, that observe, observe orient, decide, and act. And who, whichever fighter pilots had the faster OODA loop, they lived the others died. It was really life and death kind of decision. I think the same thing here. If you want to move faster, you have to pulse faster. So, you know, at the heart of our work is this daily huddle. And most of our competition, you know, sets that aside at the peril of their clients. Um, the first thing Steve Jobs did when he took over Apple is he turned his conference room into a situation room and the team he chose to turn around Apple met every day. He ended up having lunch then every day with Jonathan Ive. Um, I just got Elon Book's, uh, Musk's new book yesterday, and I've just yeah. started to dig into sure. it. And he's really into the importance of a rapid meeting, making decisions, and getting things done today. Don't wait till tomorrow. Uh, Nate and the team at Airbnb, when they hit their that pandemic day where they lost a billion dollars worth of bookings, I said, Nate, what did you guys do, you and Brian and the senior team? He said, we went into a daily huddle seven days a week. So yes, it's important to learn, but it takes six data points, as we know in Scrum, to see a pattern. And if I'm only looking at information once a week, it's going to take me a month and a half. If it's only once a month, it's going to take me a half a year. But if I'm looking at it daily, I can see right. the trend, you know, in a week. So I think whoever has the learn, decide, act cycle faster than the competition has a leg up in the marketplace. So I do think speed matters. Now, I know you are, you are uh, limited for time, Vern, so I'll have one last question for you. So your right. work has been extremely seminal. I would dare say probably more than you realize because I meet so many EOers mm. that have seen their lives transform as a result of EO. And scaling up is a great Thank tool. You. And I've heard many accelerators um, say they've changed their 
the way they see their business as a result of that material. So you've Thank produced you. a lot of work that has changed people's lives in one way or another. What's your mm. aspiration in life? What's success for you? What are you hoping to to like to see uh, for yourself? Well, we did reset our own BHAG, Andreas. You know, I calculated, we, we really finally figured out our job to be done, which I think is the single most important question an entrepreneur has to answer. What is the job of your milkshake? You know, the great, right. late, yes. great Clay Christensen's four minute video we have every entrepreneur watch. I love it. And ours is to scale up the valuation, the value of your business, to get you to think as much as an investor as an owner. And I did a quick calculation. Last year was my 40th year of helping entrepreneurs. And I calculated about 800 billion in value had been added. Um, our new BHAG is in the next 10 years to deliver 2 trillion. Now, 2 trillion is still just a drop in one year's global GDP. And we wanna take 10 years, but we still think that'll put a dent in the universe if we can continue to add that, that much value or valuation to the clients that we work with. For me personally, my role model is Peter Drucker. You know, Peter wrote 39 books. And what's interesting is he only wrote a third of those before his 65th birthday, which is your traditional age of retirement. He did two thirds of his best work after retirement. Wow. And so I turned 65 next year in 2024. And so I'm hoping to write at least twice as many books uh, as I have in this first you know, part of my life in the next part. And so that's, I love writing and I love kind of synthesizing and communicating ideas. It's my thing. And I know lots of people that would be eagerly awaiting to read them, Vern. All so right. I hope you get to Well, that. thank you. Thank uh, you. Vern, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for your insights, uh, sharing your, mm -hmm. your journey, sharing your aspirations, sharing your stories. You always have the most entertaining stories in business. Thank you. Well, and thank you. Uh, I hope you get to write those books. Thank you, Andreas. I, and I appreciate the work you're doing to share these ideas, particularly around culture and people, because at the end of the day, it's hard to scale without them. It is totally. Thank you, Vern. Thank you.